One last concept that I'm going to leave you with is what's called the bulkhead pattern. All right. This is the third way in which you can handle uh, outages like this. The first naive way is to just create more instances, right? That's the first way. Second way is to have intelligent circuit breakers where it detects something has gone wrong and it breaks the circuit. The third way to handle it, and it kind of can do all these things together. It's not mutually exclusive. The third way to handle it is to use a pattern called the bulkhead pattern. So what is the bulkhead pattern? The name comes from the use of this terminology in uh, shipbuilding. And I say this as someone who has no idea about shipbuilding or even parts of a ship. So I'm gon probably gonna be way off here, but I'm gonna be hopefully convey the concept at least as it, as it applies to microservices. This is not a shipbuilding workshop after all. So I hopefully I have, uh, I hope I have that license to go wrong in some of those, uh, those areas. So the way it works in shipbuilding is, um, you gotta be smart about what kind of uh, architecture you have for shipbuilding because fault tolerance is critical. You're dealing with people's lives there. If a ship sinks, people lose their lives. So the way they build the ship is that they wanna make it as fault tolerant as possible when it comes to things that could go wrong. Like let's say there is, uh, there is a hole in the ship. If I were to build a ship, a hole in the ship is gonna cause the ship to go down. But if an expert were to build a ship, they're gonna have patterns to prevent the failures from cascading and prevent the failures from causing the whole ship to sink, right? So one of the things that they do is create these things called bulkheads, right? So let's say there are these rooms, these cabins at the close to the stern of the ship, right? So they're at the bottom, they are susceptible to a hole which causes the walls of those rooms to break and water to enter the room. What they do is they make it's mandatory for them to make those key rooms watertight so that even if those the hull were to be breached and water were to enter the room, it's not going to take the whole ship down. It's only going to affect that particular portion of the ship. All right. Fairly obvious, right? It's common sense, but that's a pattern that's uh, very widely followed. And that's something that we can do for this as well. Somebody actually mentioned this in the chat earlier and I noticed it and I want to call attention to that now. So it's basically using the bulkhead pattern in the case of microservices and threats. So the idea is something like this. Imagine, look back to uh, the thing that we talked about, right? So let's see, uh, what was the problem here? The problem was that requests were coming in and uh, things were piling up, threads were piling up. So it ended up being that one microservice could essentially have brought the other microservices down. So here B is the one that's slow, A is fast, but B is consuming, the request to B is consuming all the available threads. So there are no threads available for A, and that's a problem. It's similar to the hull being breached and water, this water in one room sinking the whole ship. So what if you could create a bulkhead? What if you could create a watertight compartment for the threads of B and a separate watertight compartment for the threads of A. See what I'm saying? What if you had separate thread pools for A, separate thread pools for B, separate limits for max threads for A, separate limits for max threads for B. Even if you weren't doing any of the circuit breaker stuff that we talked about, right? Let's say you do none of that stuff. You just do this bulkhead thing. You create separate thread pool resources. B is slowing down, all right? A is going fast. B has all these requests lined up. It's consumed all the threads, but still the amount of threads allocated for A is not affected by what's affected, what B is having, right? Water is not leaking from the B's thread pool to the A's thread pool. I'm trying to draw an analogy to the bulkhead thing, right? So they, you've kind of isolated those two out. So if B is slow, B requests to B are, is gonna to continue to pile up, that's continue to be slow, while A is not affected, requests to A is gonna be fast. All right, so you have basically created these two quote unquote watertight compartments. You've separated those two out and you've applied the bulkhead concept. All right, that's essentially what bulkhead is. And that is also something you can use the Hystrix annotation for. So how do you configure bulkheads? It's actually fairly simple. It's very similar to the kind of configuration we've been doing for circuit breakers. You do this at the Hystrix command level. So you basically have control 
over providing different buckets for different methods, which is absolutely required because you don't want uh, multiple conflicting methods to be sharing the same bucket and one causing the problem for the other. So at the Hystrix command level, you can set up a couple of properties. The first property of, of concern here is the thread pool key, right? The minute you provide a thread pool key, you're basically creating a separate space. You're creating a separate bulkhead. So method A and method B, let's say you want to have uh, two different methods. You don't want one to interfere with the other. For each of those methods, create a separate thread pool key. So you're basically creating a new set for those threads, right? You're creating a new thread pool for those threads and you call it with a certain thread pool key so that you can reuse the thread pool key and have multiple methods share the same thread pool. Or you can have individual thread pool keys for different methods so that you want to make sure that those methods do not share the same thread pool, right? So is the first property. Create a thread pool key so that you're essentially creating a separate bulkhead. Once you've created that bulkhead, the next step is to configure that bulkhead. There are a couple of properties you can set. First, you can set the thread pool size, right? How many threads do you want allowable at a time? How many concurrent threads do you want to allow for that bulkhead? So let's say you uh, you decide, okay, I don't want to have more than 20 threads waiting for the movie info API. So you set this property, core size, so the value is 20, which means they're always going to be only at the most 20 threads waiting for response from the movie API. Uh, if the other one comes, it's not going to be allowed in the thread pool. It can, however, queue. So you can also specify the second property, which is how many requests do you want queued so that they're waiting even though they're not consuming threads, right? So that's another concept where you can have the requests wait for a bit and uh, just sit there without consuming thread resources, but at the same time, not triggering uh, an error or a fallback or anything like that. So you can have uh, max queue size, which is basically how many requests are waiting in the queue before they can get access to the thread. So this is also a value that I can configure. In this example, I've configured the value of 20 for the maximum concurrent threads and 10 requests to be waiting outside till they do get a free thread. So they're going to wait once a thread frees up, then they're going to go into the concurrent thread. It's kind of like two levels of wait. Uh, if it's beyond this, then it's going to go to the fallback mechanism, which you're already familiar with. But basically this is, these are the only two properties required to set up uh, a bulkhead and uh, you have more information about these properties and more online. So I definitely encourage you to check this out. But then again, I want you to understand that the way to configure bulkheads is using these properties in the Hystrix command annotation.